Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back indoors. Hopefully you're thawing out and had some good workshops. Um, I'm really excited to introduce this afternoon's plenary. Before I do that, I just want to remind you that this evening there are some neighborhood dinners around Chicago. So if you're interested in joining a small group for dinner, um, checking out a different neighborhood in the city, please sign up. Uh, two floors up, there's the sign-up sheets for dinner. Um, so yesterday we talked about starting a love affair with the street, and today we're going to talk about um, changing hearts and minds and helping people imagine something new by experiencing it. So to introduce the topic and to introduce all of our speakers, I'm really delighted to welcome Sky Duncan, director of NACTA's Global Designing Cities Initiative. Thank you, Corinne, and welcome. How were the workshops? Who did a bike shop? Yeah? Workshop? Who went on a boat? Oh, I like it. This is the biggest one. Who got on a boat? I know there were some people. That sounds awesome as well. Well, um, welcome and thanks, Corinne, for the introduction. Um, I'm so thrilled to be here today to introduce an incredible lineup of speakers and to give you a little bit of background about some of the work we've been doing just to introduce and frame this. And as Corinne said, this is really a chance to discuss different strategies and tools around how do we help change hearts and minds. And so we've titled this panel, Seeing is Believing. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I think most of you probably know all the incredible guides that come out of NACTO. Um, and about three years ago, Jeanette Sadat Khan launched the Global Designing Cities Initiative to take a lot of those lessons to the international uh, frame. And so we were producing the Global Street Design Guide, working with a network of professionals uh, from around the world. So we had over 40 countries and 70 cities to really look at how we can ask what is possible in terms of transforming how we think about our streets and to begin that love affair with the street that Corinne was just mentioning. And for us, behind the premise was to really take the very outdated hierarchical pyramid of how we've been thinking about our streets, putting the car first, and to invert that and to put pedestrians as our top priority and in particular to focus on our most vulnerable users, our children, our people with disabilities, and our elderly folk. And we were thrilled earlier this year to have Mike Bloomberg announce that we had this actually as a free resource, so we still have it for sale outside with Island Press, but now we can really increase accessibility around the world. We've also emulated the very successful process of the endorsement of the Urban Street Design Guide, and we're thrilled to say we have over 35 cities and 20 organizations. So we produced the guidance, but now a lot of my team's work, uh, we're very honored to be working in five different cities, giving technical assistance around the world, and in many different ways of trying to help people to see, to believe, to make the change. So we do work in policy and design guidance. Uh, we do a lot of work on capacity building and trainings, and interim interventions and collecting metrics. But it really is the one today that I wanted to talk about is the interim interventions, because this is where we've been able to take lessons from cities like New York, from Buenos Aires and Argentina, and right here in Chicago, where we can take not more than, not a lot more than a bit of paint and some really passionate people to come together and to really show how we can transform our streets and increase uh, the use and uh, the uses and the, all the different activities that we can have there. And I wanted to show this one image because uh, in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, uh, we took a bunch of people out to just transform it, to try this, right, to help them see a new possibility. And, uh, and we just did it in chalk for a day. And so we did this, and uh, Mr. Fakade at the time, he was the chief engineer, and he came up to us, and we just finished the chalk. And he said, Sky, you've taken space away from the car. I said, that's right, Mr. Ficare, we have. And he said, well, they need that space. I said, well, actually, they don't. You know, 96% of your population are transit riders or pedestrians. There's giant 50-meter crossings. And let's see. Let's watch. And we watched the bus turn and the truck turn. And he saw that it worked. And we showed that it was safer for people and children. And he was silent for about five minutes. And then he came back and tapped me on the shoulder. And he said, well, why is this not permanent? We said, well, that's exactly what we're trying to do. So we went back six months later and actually transformed that with the next round of paint uh, to make it an interim rather than just a one-day pop-up. 
And the final very quick example I wanted to show was one that we worked on just about a month ago with our partners from Fortaleza, some of which are in the room today, where we took the heart of a neighborhood that was really just about parked cars uh, and movement and transformed that space. And in 72 hours, with many people working together, we were able to take spaces like this and transform them and show them a new possibility of their streets, where they could now cross streets safely and bring their families together. And what was incredible, actually, was we were out there painting and did some numbers for the kids, and the kids were so desperate to play. You can see the paint's not even dry, and they're still leaping, right? The cones are there on it. And so the stories that came out of it almost overnight were incredible. We put up posters so that people could see and believe what's possible and vote with these stickers and, and ask and, uh, to have this permanent. So it's a very exciting project. And I think you know, to see the look of this young child really helps us all kind of believe uh, in these types of projects. And I want to close by just showing this image of um, this child, because while we were painting, this kid was running from one side of the street to the other, and he was ecstatic that he could run around, and we'd closed it off for cars. We said, you know what, tomorrow, you're actually going to be able to run from here to there with no cars available. And this was his reaction. I'll see if it works. These guys at the back. I don't know if you guys can hit play or not. <laughs> So it was an incredible experience and a very powerful time. And so just going from a quick 10 second video to a little bit longer of a video, I have the pleasure of first introducing uh, Streets Films. Now, sadly, Clarence had to leave this morning. We'd love to have had him here in person, but I'm sure it needs no introduction. How many people in this room have seen a Streets film? <laughs> Woo! Amazing. Incredible work where we can share these links with other people where we have the opportunity to use it as an advocacy tool to help to change hearts and minds. And you know, for those of us who don't have the privilege of traveling and seeing all these projects, it's a really great tool that we can use to see new ideas. So I'd like to show the film if we can hit play and I'll be back up to introduce the first speaker. Thank you. You know, Street Films was really just a great experiment at the beginning. We really wanted to go out and document how bad the streets were, but also show people how good they could be. And right away, the films got people motivated. And they used them as tools, and they used them as rallying cries to say, let's make our city better. I can really think back to very specific cases where particularly Streets Blog or Street Films made the case in a way that swayed public opinion and swayed political opinion. And today, I think it's really influenced the way we talk about streets and public space. So when I got to DC, I had read Streets Blog and seen street films, but I was really happy that within like a month of me getting there, Clarence Eckerson shows up and does this great video. We really started to get, to get the message out and reset the message about what DC DOT was trying to do. I think one of the first street films I was part of was the case for protected bike lanes. It was a turning point for our work at Transportation Alternatives, but certainly for the city as the city began to take that idea seriously. And that strip there with all those painted stripes on it, that's the buffer that's supposed to keep cars away from cyclists. But you can see part of the problem with even a, a buffered bike lane is that people will park in it. And if you really want to make this as safe as possible, what you need to do is physically separate it from the traffic. All you have to do is switch the location of the bike lane and the parked cars. So it would go sidewalk, bike lane, parked cars. And that row of parked cars would then act as a physical separator between the bicycles and the fast moving traffic. And that would make people a lot safer. This is a very popular idea in a lot of other cities and it's proven very successful there, and it's something that New York should certainly think about adopting. And street films really legitimized the idea and put it out in the world, and cities across the U.S. paid attention to it, and the DOT commissioner at the time, Jeanette Sadekan, started paying attention to it. 
I knew that it was going to be a very interesting tenure at the New York City Department of Transportation when one of my very first encounters was with Clarence Eckerson, who was in one of those low bikes with his camera just so. This is a commute in uh, Denmark. You'd see this on a rush hour basis. You'd see all these bike bicyclists coming through like that. So we're not there yet. But we're trying. Street films and street blog have been lobbying for this kind of change for many, many years. In fact, they actually tilled the soil that allowed the kinds of changes that we implemented to happen. I think about making the case for Sunday Streets, which is our Cicla Via in San Francisco. Uh, we weren't seeing traction on that very good idea for a while uh, until some of our elected leaders and particularly the mayor saw a street film about Ciclavias in Bogota, and it really, frankly, opened up his mind, um, and we were able to then effectively advocate to bring Sunday Streets to San Francisco. We really needed to decide right from the beginning how we were gonna get the films out there. We held public screenings, we made DVDs, mailed them around the country, but really, it was YouTube, and YouTube, remember, was just in its infancy, and we made the decision just let them go out and be tools for people in their communities to use to accomplish change. And then when I went to Chicago, Streets Blog understood the impact of stakeholder engagement and activism and rolling it all into one. And Streets Blog helps to externally get people motivated to make the change and celebrates the changes as you make them, which I think is super important. When the proverbial crap hit the fan, they were there to stand behind us and the changes, and they actually telegraphed to a larger audience the importance of safer streets, more sustainable streets. And without their support, I don't think we would nearly have gotten as far as we did. Street blog is really important in helping to defend livable streets uh, from what seems to be the inevitable backlash. The classic case, of course, is the Prospect Park West bike lane battle the great bike lash of 2010 and 11. There was this, this real torrent of opinion and against what DOT was trying to do. And it was all driven by just a few people who were upset about the Prospect Park West bike lane. And they had a pretty powerful set of friends and acquaintances inside city government, inside the media. What Streets Blog did was just get the truth out because you can just show here's the data that shows injuries are down and there's actually a, a pretty substantial grassroots movement to make this change happen. Um, my daughter Anna, my wife Zoe, we love the lane. It's uh, very important to us as uh, advocates and as residents here so happy to see hundreds of Brooklynites and other New Yorkers out today saying yes to safety and yes to the future of New York City streets. was for the work of Streets Films and Street Blog. I really don't think any of us here in the room today would be where we are without them in, in really fighting for the changes that, that we're hoping to see. Um, I have the pleasure now of introducing Chris Bruntlett, our first speaker. Now, Chris is the co-founder of Motor City. He's an architectural designer and a background, and he moved to Vancouver in uh, 2007 and saw this real gap in helping to kind of market the lifestyle of cycling in our everyday lives. And so he co-founded uh, co uh, Motor City with his partner, Melissa. And there they work with writing and filmmaking and photography and giving public talks to really try, and they say, to inspire healthier, happier, and simpler forms of urban mobility. Now, please join with me in inviting Chris to the stage. He's going to talk about how to humanize a lot of these changes and how we can market active transportations to local communities. Please, Chris. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Sky, for that lovely introduction. Um, OK, let's get started. So for those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Chris Brunlett, and I've had the privilege of living, working, and cycling in Vancouver for the past 10 years. 
Boom. So three and a half years ago, my partner Melissa and I started a content creation agency, which we called Medacity, that stemmed out of the bike advocacy work we were doing on our evenings and weekends. And we've been lucky enough to work with a close group of friends, many of whom you see on the stage here today, uh, sorry, on the screen, um, on a number of photography and film campaigns for public and private partners around the world. So today I'm going to share what we've learned over the years uh, in what I'm calling the eight rules of effective bike marketing, which demonstrate how thinking more critically about the imagery we use help achieve the goal of building safer streets. So Vancouver has made tremendous strides as a cycling city over the last 10 years, rolling out a AAA bike network across the downtown peninsula and into the neighborhoods around the city center. But we found ourselves frustrated with the idea that getting on the bike was an athletic pursuit. It was dangerous, it was seen as political, it was seen as complicated. And we didn't see the changing demographics of people riding on the cycle tracks represented in the imagery that was being presented by the media, by bike advocates, or by the city of Vancouver themselves. So we set about changing that, initially through passion projects on evenings and weekends, which quickly snowballed into a full-time job. So before I get started on those eight rules of bike marketing, I just want to talk a little bit about why the imagery we use is so important. Whether it's on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, illustrating an editorial or a story that we're writing, or envisioning a film campaign or a photography campaign, using the right images can build political capital. We can get the public, the press, politicians, and the business community on board, and the end goal of building safer streets is much easier with them on your side. So we hope to use images that stir their imagination and help them understand why a vibrant, livable city isn't about two fast-moving lanes of traffic and two parking spots outside their front door. Secondly, we also need to consider the role that enticing imagery can use in encouraging new users to cycling. Cities spend a great deal of political capital and actual capital on their bike infrastructure and policy but seldom consider a marketing component to that approach. Even if it's just a small amount of their budget, studies have proved that it will be a valuable return on that investment, with the ideal scenario being that someone sees that image that you're presenting and says, hey, I can do that. You only need to delve into the comment section to realize how we've organized ourselves by mode of transportation. And that transportation tribalism has become a destructive barrier on and off the streets, despite our cities becoming more multimodal places. We hope that presenting a human face and a story to that person on a bike will hopefully shed the label of quote-unquote cyclist and humanize them to the viewer. If anything, it reminds that driver next time they encounter someone on the bike, on the road, that they're also a mother, a father, a son, a daughter, with their own goals and aspirations. <laughs> Finally, we hope through the imagery you use that we're normalizing the act of utility cycling. Most North Americans still see getting on a bike as a recreational pursuit that is done either for fun or for exercise. And they can't really imagine a world where one would cycle to the shop, to the grocery store, to dinner, or to take their kids to school. So we strive to make cycling in regular clothes on an upright bike, bareheaded, with a hauling a bag of groceries as normal as it is here as it is elsewhere, be it Amsterdam, Copenhagen, Vancouver, or Chicago. So let's get started. Rule number one is share the stories, not the statistics. In a post-truth society, people believe what they feel to be true and not what the facts and figures actually state. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt are very normal reactions to change, and bringing facts to a culture war is like bringing a spoon to a knife fight. We need to learn to set aside the graphs, charts, and statistics that we normally rely on and connect to people on a human level, explain how they'll benefit pers personally from quote-unquote controversial changes. It's imperative we tell stories, craft narratives, shape messages that appeal emotionally to our fellow citizens rather than intellectually. Rule number two, think outside the echo chamber. Both our personal and professional circles, online and in real life, have become increasingly self-reinforcing and self-congratulatory. 
We, need to, um, we surround ourselves with like-minded people, and algorithms feed us news and ideas that strengthen our existing worldviews. We need to learn and to break out of these echo chambers. We need to stop preaching to the converted and think bigger and more creatively about getting outside of our existing feedback loops. This will help spread our message to a broader audience, challenge us to think differently about our problems, and take a diverse range of perspectives into consideration. Rule number three, promote the bike culture you want. So we believe that it's crucial that you're aspirational in the types of imagery that you use. Think of it as a marketing exercise rather than a documenting one. You need to represent the types of people you want to see cycling on your city streets, not the ones that are currently using them. That includes a variety of ages and abilities. We should also consider the types of bikes they're riding and the types of clothing they're wearing. And yes, it's okay to show people not wearing helmets, if, like me, that's the type of bike culture you ultimately envisage for your city. Rule number four, be the diversity you want to see. In a similar vein, it's important to show a variety of ages, abilities, ethnicities, and body types. If you can't see it, you can't be it. The worlds of cycling, transportation, and urbanism are still very pale, stale, and male, but things are slowly getting better. In the meantime, we should share the stories of often ignored people that are cycling or would like to cycle, reinforcing the idea that building safer streets levels the playing field for all users, regardless of their income or influence. Rule five, market a lifestyle, not a product. This is something the automobile industry has been doing for decades. They've been selling the ideas of joy, freedom, and unlimited mobility, even if it means lying by showing the streets unclogged with traffic. We need to use the same strategies, although I would argue that we're at least being truthful in our representations of getting on a bike. For us, that means telling compelling human stories where the bicycle plays a supporting role to that person's lifestyle. Rule six, make it look safe, simple, and sexy. Some of the biggest mental barriers around urban cycling is that it's urban warfare. It's seen as dangerous, complicated, and a little bit sweaty. We need to carefully consider whether the photo we're including in that tweet or story reinforces those misconceptions. Number seven, celebrate the success stories. The media loves the conflict, and with proposed bicycle infrastructure, it will unquestionably focus on controversy. We seldom see good news stories of new users and businesses that result from these quote-unquote controversial decisions. We need a counter-narrative that reinforces the social, environmental, and financial benefits of building bike lanes. And last but not least, show, don't tell. So allow me to stress that nobody, I mean nobody, likes to be preached to. And part of the resentment of quote-unquote cyclists is the guilt that people are made for not riding a bike. We're not going to guilt them onto their bikes, nor will we convince them via words. But if we show them a more enjoyable, efficient mode of transportation that exists, they just might try it. So I'm going to finish up by showing a short uh, trailer for a film series that we worked on. Um, that a lot of life, including riding a bike, or traveling, or running a business, is all the same. It's the best of times, and it's the worst of times. But no matter what, if you just get on with it, stop to smell the roses along the way, and keep going no matter what, you will have a happy journey. So that entire film series, the Vancouver Cycle, <laughs> Vancouver Cycle Chic Films and a number of other film projects we've worked on are all available on our website. Thanks for your attention this afternoon. I hopefully, hopefully you got something out of this exercise. Um, if you have any questions, 
Uh, I can certainly hang out in the lobby after the talk is done. Otherwise, you can contact me uh, via email or Facebook or Twitter. Uh, our website is modacitylife.com. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. That was great. I can't wait to check out those uh, movies, and hopefully you guys can do so as well. It is so important. I think a lot of us fight every day to get projects on the ground and see the real difference uh, in the physical realm, but of course, how we talk about that and the different tools of communication are fundamental to reaching a very broad audience, and like you say, to go beyond probably many of the people in this room already converted uh, to a lot of these ideas. So thanks very much, Chris. Um, next, I'd like to, I believe we have Ed Solis in the house. He's, there he is, fabulous. Um, so Ed's coming from the city of San Jose, where he's the recreation superintendent uh, of the Parks, Recreation and Neighbourhood Services. Now he's going to talk to us about a fabulous program that we've seen proliferating around the world uh, in the past few decades. From Bogota to New York City, from Sao Paulo and of course to San Jose. He's going to talk to us about open streets and how this program and these events have been instrumental in changing how people see their streets and understand what's possible for this fundamental network of public space at the heart of their cities. So please join me in welcoming Ed to the stage. All right, quick show of hands. How many of you came to Chicago without a coat like me? Right? It's been horrible. <laughs> Fat dude is cold. All right, so I am not a planner nor an engineer. They had to burn down my high school to get me out of it. Um, I'm actually a recreational professional, and so it's uh, wonderful to be here with you all. We're going to talk about uh, a wonderful program, Viva Calle San Jose, um, and so we'll jump right into it. So a couple of years ago, I was very fortunate enough um, to be asked to travel to Guadalajara, Mexico to observe uh, a gentleman named Gil Penalosa in action. All I was supposed to do was listen and report back. Uh, and I drank the Kool-Aid. So when we went, uh, we heard Gil speak about the impacts of open streets and how effective they are and how great they are. Being a skeptic that I am, the proof is in the pudding. That Sunday, we got on a bike, and I saw about 180,000 people on one street. Uh, it was a sea of humanity, and I was immediately moved to, uh, to come right back to work and to talk about starting an open streets program in San Jose. And when you talk to Americans about giving up their cars, it doesn't go over very well. Um, we have mandatory drug testing at the city of San Jose. I passed mine with a B. Uh, people were like, what are you talking about? We are not closing the streets, Ed. We just stick to recreation, hand out some balls, work with the seniors, stay in your lane. And I said, no, no, we, we, need, to, we need to try this. Uh, and so after we sat down with some, some amazing people in the city, we decided let's just, uh, let's just start to explore it. And early on, I understood that you can't do it alone. It's not going to be Ed. It's not going to be the six people that work on my team. It's a lot of people within the city and with the city of San Jose not only civil servants, but nonprofit partners and people who uh, think alike. So one of the things I started to realize is that everybody rides a bike except me. DOT, how many people are in DOT? Everyone, right? Everybody in San Jose DOT rides a bike to work. None of them have cars, it's amazing. When I met with our Valley Transportation Authority and said, hey, we're gonna ask you to reroute the buses, guess what? They all ride bikes, they were cool with it. Uh, so it was awesome. I kept expecting for people to say no, but people started saying, let's give it a try. Um, so first and foremost, one of the biggest hurdles by far is getting past the public safety piece. And so when I met with our, our, our San Jose officers, they were very uh, standoffish, if you will. Any officers in the house? Just kidding. Uh, they were very like, what are you talking about, bro? We're going to close six miles of city streets. People are going to get robbed. It's going to be may mayhem. People will be smoking weed. Uh, so what I said is, let's get a few of you folks, and let's go to L.A. The L.A. Ciclovia program is awesome. They do six a year. Uh, so let's take a trip to Los Angeles, and I'm going to have you do the cop talk. Talk to the officers, and at the end of the day, if it just doesn't work out and you don't want to do it, we'll, we, won't even, we won't even get it off the ground. Uh, to my amazement, that evening when we sat around and discussed it, one of the first things the officer said were, there were a ton of families out there. There are a lot of kids. This is a great thing. Let's give it a shot. 
Let's give it a shot. So one of the things we did is we came back and we loaded up more people. And we went out and visited our friends in San Francisco. We saw Sunday streets. Uh, we started to learn and kind of garner some, some information about what to do and what not to do. Aaron Paley, uh, who no longer heads the LA Ciclovia, was a great mentor as well as uh, Gil, Gil Penalosa. So we got to learn a lot of things about what to do and what not to do. So within one year, we went from concept to execution. That is the route of our first uh, uh, Viva Calles, San Jose, six miles long. Uh, Gil Penalosa always talks about the difference between a special event, a parade, and an open streets program. So Gil said you got to do six miles, nothing less. Uh, if you look along the bottom route there, if you've never been to San Jose, Story Road is that long blue line. <laughs> That's like shutting down Lakeshore Drive or whatever the biggest uh, street in your city is, that's what it was. So getting over that hump was amazing, but I said, let's just go crazy, let's just do it big. Uh, and we expected 10,000 folks, we got 35,000 people to show up. So when you talk about impacts to, to, uh, to cities, the first thing people say, and the first thing somebody said to me was, you're gonna kill our business. You, if you shut down the streets, where are people gonna park? Well, they don't have to park anywhere. If you look at that picture, that's one parking space. Every single one of those bikes is a potential customer. Somebody who wants to buy something to drink, something to eat. Everybody invests massive amounts of money on street signs. Big, colorful street signs. Why? Because people fly by their storefront at 35, 40 miles an hour. You have to attract their eye. But when people are on bikes, they're coming by at two, three, four miles an hour. The great thing about open streets programs, there's no beginning or end. It's not a race. Does anybody here, the, here know the term mammals? Middle-aged males in Lycra? That's a great one, right? There's no velodrome, there's no helmets, you're not getting down and dirty. It's a nice leisurely ride. You can jump on and jump off wherever you like along the route. And so one of the things you have to work with business owners is to let them know your customers are gonna show up, they're just not gonna show up in vehicles. So it's a great thing. Another amazing benefit is the social integration and the at-risk populations. How many people tell their children to go out and play in the street? <laughs> Nobody, right? But when the streets are completely free of traffic, the young and the old. Uh, w when we uh, went to Mexico, I, I met a gentleman. Uh, he and his group, they were completely blind. And he said, Sunday is the only day that we get out and we can, we can walk the streets and we feel safe because uh, there's no traffic. And so open streets uh, attract the young and the old. You see a lot of families, you see a lot of little ones. So that little guy right there is on San Carlos. Uh, it's just as cute as a button, isn't he? Uh, and then that lady can skateboard better than anybody I know. What else? It's amazing. So that San Jose, we are the capital of the Silicon Valley, and we do get a lot of smog. Um, open Streets has a very amazing impact on traffic. So what we did is we worked with our folks in DOT, and we said, can you do some traffic counts? They, tra they, they counted up all the cars on the streets every Sunday, before and after. And in three years, I made this slide just for you DOT folks. We took about 414,000 cars off the streets. We eliminated 595 tons of carbon dioxide, and that equals making 126 cars just completely disappear for a whole year. That's the impact that it has to the environment. And then it's recreational. Every year we do a survey of our folks. We get about 1,000 surveys turned back in. 93%, 93% of the people who do open streets say they get over an hour of strenuous exercise. This cycling body does our, our route every year. This past year, it was seven miles. I went up and back three times, three times seven is 21 miles. Uh, I was not taking the stairs. I was taking the elevator for the, for the next two weeks. Um, and so you can see two pictures there. The one on the left is Guadalajara. The one on the right, that big building on the right is my office, that's City Hall. We had 130,000 people show up last, Sunday, or last month to our Viva Calles program. Um, it's just an amazing way to transform your cities. So we did it again. We went a bit, little bit longer. And we started to add a lot of different activations. So as, as you uh, start to build your Open Streets program, you're gonna find that a lot of people will come and wanna partner with you. The first year, you gotta chase everybody down. The second year, they start coming to you. And the third year, they're in line. So this is a, a maker's fair we did with San Jose Made, a local uh, group of artisans. Um, you could buy jewelry and crafts and food that day. It was a huge, huge success. Everybody was doing, uh, just having a great time. We had a, a lemonade vendor this year, organic. Everything has to be organic. Uh, they sold 64 gallons of lemonade. They ran out. It was pretty awesome. 
This is Santa Clara. This is our main, main street. And in the background, you see uh, Five Wounds uh, Catholic Church. And this was a banda that walked down the street with horses. And if you don't know what a banda is, it's a, it's a band, but it, they get down. They dance. The horses dance. Uh, it was amazing. Um, but you also have to have a group that are as crazy as you to get Open Streets programs because people are going to show up and tell you you're insane. People are going to complain about how much it costs. People are going to complain that they're locked into their homes and, and they can't get around. But all those things could be mediated with great outreach, great marketing, and a great team. As we move forward, we're moving towards two uh, activations a year. We're really excited about it. And if anybody here wants to start an Open Street program and you don't know where to start, come and see me after. I got little stickers for everybody. Um, you can always reach me on the phone. You can email me, and I would love to come to your town and talk about the amazing impacts of Open Streets. Thank you very much for having me. Have a great day. Thank you to Ed. I think, you know, open street events are just such a powerful way to help people see their streets in a different way. Uh, who, which city, like, does your city have open streets? Put your hand up. Uh, does everyone, does any city have it monthly? Does any city have it weekly? Down here in the house, we have some Bogota folk. Um, and also in Sao Paulo as well. So I think it is an incredibly powerful event, and I think we're, uh, we're starting to see it proliferate through the United States. But I encourage you to also come and chat to some of the international folk here where these cities actually do this every Sunday. And so it's not just a yearly event, it's built into people's daily and week, week, weekly, weekend routines. Um, and it's really a wonderful experience, so uh, do come and chat to them. Uh, next up, I'd like to introduce Chris Carter. Chris is a non-practicing engineer, an optimistic urban planner, which is a very good thing, um, and a self-taught filmmaker. Uh, Chris currently oversees Boston's Autonomous Vehicle Testing Program, uh, the New Mobility Initiatives, and a portfolio of work that helped to make our streets and our sidewalks more delightful. And I can't wait until the day that we're in a delightful state everywhere. Uh, today he's going to talk to us about uh, the work he's done for sa the Safest Driver in Boston competition um, and the app that has really helped to change behavior there. So get your phones out, download the app, and please join me in welcoming Chris Carter to the stage. All right. So I manage a portfolio of things that's broad beyond transportation, but I'm excited to be here today to talk about a program we ran last fall uh, called Boston Safest Driver. And if you do have your phone on you, you can go to the App Store, you can download this right now, and you can uh, prep yourself for the end of this talk to go out and, and see how it works. So like many cities, in uh, 2015, we put together a Vision Zero program. And as part of that action program initially, we identified distracted driving and uh, engagement as two things we really wanted to focus on early in the city of Boston to bring the message to uh, you know, neighborhoods and communities of what we were trying to do around safer streets. And as you may know if you've been to Boston, we've done a pretty good job of branding driving in our city. Uh, this is uh, sort of the, the prevailing myth that we are not great drivers and it turns out there's actually some evidence to back that up. So, Allstate Insurance has named us two years in a row the worst city in the country to drive in. You are more likely to get into a crash in Boston than pretty much anywhere else. Um, and if there's one thing other than driving that uh, we are passionate about, it's, it's also winning. So we, we don't like being last in anything. I wouldn't use the Tom Brady picture here, but that's obvious. So Bill Russell uh, won 11 championships in 13 seasons. Sorry, Chicago. Um, and you know, the, the data from all states sort of came out in the news and people said, well, there's no way we're worse drivers than New York, right? Um, but it turns out that we probably are. And it turns out that everybody thinks they're a pretty good driver. So this is actually, uh, you know, US-wide, not just liberal folks in the Northeast that think we're better than everyone else. Uh, but it's, it's a pretty common practice that folks actually think they, they are not the problem on the roadways that somebody else is, right? Their behaviors are pretty safe, but it's everybody else that they need to be afraid of. So we were wrestling with those ideas. How do we uh, help people sort of reflect on their own driving behaviors? How do we engage with the community around Vision Zero? How do we help them understand that maybe they're not the best driver out there? And we were looking for some good examples, 
And it turns out the insurance industry has been doing this for years, right? They have telematics programs that you can uh, get a device and plug it into your car. Some are on mobile apps. And they allow you to sort of uh, optimize the rate that you pay based on how good a driver you are. So it also turns out that one of those companies that uh, makes those apps is in our backyard. And we reached out to them and said, would you be interested in partnering with the city on a way to have people reflect on their own driving behaviors in Boston? And what came out of that was uh, a not as cleverly named app, uh, but Boston's Safest Driver. And what it does is uh, give you a score based on five different criteria. So your phone distraction, if you're playing with your phone while you're driving, uh, speeding, harsh braking, acceleration, rapid uh, sort of turns that you might be making. And puts those into a score out of zero to 100. It also allows you to sort of drill down uh, and look at individual trip level behavior as well. There's also a leaderboard component of this. So we had them sort of build in, uh, I want to compete against my neighborhood, so my zip code, uh, my city or town. So we, we open it up to the 101 cities and towns surrounding Boston. And uh, your friends or your family, or in some cases, elected uh, officials in those communities too. And you, uh, uh, after you sort of uh, log your trip, it sort of gives you a pop-up notification when you're done driving. Uh, you can check out your new score. You can open it up. You can look and see where maybe some behaviors occurred over time. So we took this app, we brought it out to the public through a snazzy marketing campaign. Um, if you have ever tried to get someone to download an app, it's really hard. If you tried to get people to download an app from government that's going to watch you how to drive, <laughs> it's even harder. Uh, but we managed to, so what we thought we would do that would get people into this would be to uh, incentivize them with prize money. So we got our, our Bella Insurance Foundation to put up $10,000 worth of prize money over three months and we're gonna pay you to be a good driver. And we gave out prizes to uh, folks on a weekly basis, you know, that had high scores. We gave out prizes to people that rode bikes or took transit trips, because we wanted to incentivize that behavior as well. Uh, and, and anybody that downloaded the app. Uh, and there's a, a $3,000 grand prize at the end. So we're trying to keep people in it long enough over those three months to have the behaviors be sticky uh, and help them sort of stay towards the end. And what it turned out was that people didn't necessarily care about the prize money. <laughs> They, they got into it at first because they thought they were prize on the money, and it quickly evolved to them competing with their friends, their family. Uh, there were lots of side bets in uh, workplaces that we heard about, you know, different sort of departments competing with each other. Uh, and it ended up being sort of uh, this sort of competition among each other and, and less about sort of the city administering this. So over the course of the competition last fall, we had a little over 5,000 users. Uh, active users in the app. We went uh, logged about 3 million miles, a whole bunch of different kinds of trips in there, even ferry trips uh, that are logged in there. We were, have, we're getting uh, messages and emails from people that were comparing Uber to Lyft drivers uh, and had done some sort of analysis on that too. And we also collected uh, a whole bunch of interesting data that we sort of anonymized and aggregated so we can actually see these behaviors on our streets. So this is actually showing speeding. Um, and those little events in blue are sort of instances where you're more than six miles per hour over the speed limit. And if you know Boston well, this is actually showing up a lot of our major highways. So I-93 and the Mass Pike and some of the major sort of arterials along the river. If we look at phone use, it actually fills in the street grid. So I'm going to do a manual little like back and forth there. Whoops. Right? So you can see it kind of fill in. So people are using their phones on streets where we have pedestrians and cyclists uh, and, and sort of more vulnerable road users. And this is actually data that we can use to help inform some of our Vision Zero communication campaigns, some of the work we're doing around redesigning intersections and, and corridors. So over the, the course of the, the competition, we actually saw people stay with it uh, and scores and go down. So this is showing phone use, harsh breaking, speeding, all sort of decreasing over time, right? Uh, and there's sort of a little bit of a leveling off after about 40 days of use. What we saw among the top 25% of users was a phone use score that dropped by half. Uh, we saw uh, harsh breaking and speeding drop by about a third. Um, and what we heard from people was that at first they were monitoring every single trip that they got. They would, they would sort of look at it after they got to their office or wherever they were going. And over time, they just decided that they didn't need to monitor that, that they had sort of started developing these behaviors, right? They had put their phone in a very specific place in the car uh, to keep themselves from actually interacting with it. 
Of course, we actually wanted to you know, award people too. So this is uh, the winner from Boston Safest Driver who got uh, a $3,000 prize and also Boston Safest Backseat Driver who was a 12 month old uh, kid who's awesome, who was on, on almost every trip with her dad, he said. Um, and so when we, we talked to Deidre about what was it that made you do so well in this? She ended up having a perfect score. She started out pretty poorly, but over the, the last sort of three weeks of the program had a perfect score. And she said, I trained my 17-year-old to uh, drive this fall. So I felt like I needed to model that behavior, and we were competing with each other. And at first, it was a little bit of a sense of paranoia that, uh, not that government was watching her, but that uh, her husband and her daughter were watching her driving score. And then over time, that paranoia sort of subsided and she, was just for, she had just formed habits. Um, and when we think about what we want to do on engagement around Vision Zero, it's not government telling people to be safer. It's this accountability to each other among friends, among family, among neighbors that we're hoping to sort of breed with programs like this. So thank you for your time. If you uh, get a chance, download the app or you can read sort of more about it at the site here. That's awesome. Thanks, Chris. Uh, hopefully some other cities can start to do some similar apps and uh, have some competing. Also, great to have the data coming out, and it would be fascinating to see if you, the city started overlapping that with the crash data and really looking at different road safety issues that would be able to kind of help us delve into areas that we know we could make a big difference. Uh, next up, it's my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Ankita Chatra, who is in the Global Designing Cities Initiative as a program manager. Uh, Ankita was one of the core team members in the production of the Global Street Design Guide, so many, many, many late nights and long hours. Um, but at the moment, she's been spending the bulk of the time uh, doing technical assistance, mostly in Sao Paulo and in Mumbai. And she's going to delve a little deeper into some of the work on the ground that we've been doing, applying those strategies um, to try and really help people see an alternative. And finally, she is a great street shaper, but she's also a great Bollywood dancer. So if we're on time, she may show us a little bit at the end of her talk. Thanks, Ankita. Thank you, Sky. So I'm gonna start with this video, if it works. Um, is it working? Can you guys just check up there? All right. Great. And while this video is taking place, let me first start by giving a big shout to all the designers, planners, engineers, and practitioners in this room who know how hard it is to get projects on the ground. And yet, we also know that there is nothing more magical when we uh, see the street that was not serving anyone well turn into the space which is inviting and welcoming and really um, brings people together. But most projects, of course, take a little more time than this video to get implemented. And that's because the process of implementing a project is like this picture. You get everyone together, there are a bunch of conversations, um, of course there are some agreements, and no one ever disagrees. And often it happens so fast that all that you're left with is this blurry memory. So, but we also know that the process itself is more important. And the fact that it is how we get there and how we change hearts that really matters in the end. The designing of the process itself helps change us people's mind. But what do you do when you don't speak the same language? And by that, I don't just mean like English, Spanish, Portuguese, but also the same concepts and vision that people use to identify their streets. Sky mentioned we work in five different cities. None of them have the same language, um, different cultures. In fact, even in our team, uh, we speak different languages. We don't even speak the same English, if you know what I mean. And when you're writing a book, that, that's very handy, just so that you know. Um, but so what we had to do, really, was to come up with this way that, that could bring this language of design together, come up with tools and strategies that we could communicate with, firstly with each other, and then with our cities. So luckily, I've got a secret recipe here. 
It's very secretive, so you guys are very uh, entitled to this. Um, that, that we came up with as tools to figure out how we, we were going to work in our cities. And like any secret recipe, um, it's the basic ingredients that come together in street transformation. And if when they're put together on the right time and the right order, they add up to people and place. So we start, of course, with the basics. You've got the paint and you've got the brushes. It's quick, it's cheap, and it's high impact. Then you've got the planters for beautification that also helps in delineating some spaces, uh, designating areas where people can sit, stand, um, but also you've got treatments that can guide people's movements. And then to that you can add, of course, all the placemaking elements, uh, whether it's a chair or whether it's an umbrella, um, but that allows them to be safe and comfortable. But most importantly, it comes down to people. People who don't just use the space, but also help create the space. Kai mentioned that you know, there are these nights that we've spent um, changing the streetscape. So it's the people who were supporting us then, but also I want to talk about the people who own that space and make it their own by maintaining it. And I have to talk about the story of this lady. When we were doing Sao Miguel, the video that you saw, um, the night before I couldn't sleep, also because I had to wake up at 1 a.m., so that was another deal. But um, one of the reasons that I was worried was there was going to be no food or drinks because we couldn't find a street vendor for, for crying out aloud. Um, but when we go on site and we start changing the streetscape, uh, there's this lady who comes almost very shyly and almost like feeling like she needed permission to be there. Um, and she asks us, uh, I have some uh, juice and beer and water. Can I just sit in the corner here? And I was like, no, no, you can't. You have to be right there in the center because it's you who's going to make this place. And she did. I mean, just the smile on her face was just amazing to see throughout the event. So coming back to change and adding people and you know, coming, coming back to the idea of toolkit, we also need to figure out the strategy of using this toolkit. And every project has to start somewhere. As designers, we're often scared of making mistakes, of uh, not getting it right. There's the idea of accountability, liabilities in some cities. And for communities, it's the idea itself of change. They've never seen the street differently before, so why should they believe you that you're going to make the difference? Well, the good news is we don't really have to jump the deep end. We can try something, we can test some things, and we can also train ourselves. So, turns out, using cones, chalk, and having a bunch of in experienced engineers on site can work really well. There is time that we have to move beyond what's drawn on paper to really test it out on site. And like Sky mentioned about uh, the example from Addis, the toolkit has been really helpful in training planners and engineers. It's been an opportunity to capitalize on the momentum that we've created during the trainings itself and allow uh, people to try their solutions that are drawn on paper and test them on site. There is power in going from paper to practice, even if it's temporary. For the next one, which is showing to build support. That's another strategy, of course. And here, whether it is just for a few hours that you change a space, in Bogota, the school children came in on a Tuesday morning to see a traffic calm street, to in Sao Miguel, the video that I showed you. Now, this is in the outskirts of the city, and you can see there's no space for people to really walk, or they have no, they have no direction, and the cars are speeding. To really convert it into something that, there, um, allows them to reclaim their space. We were able to reclaim 850 square meters of space here. And remember the secret ingredient recipe that I mentioned? It's all in there, just for a different time and a different area and a different city. And I know Ed mentioned the team, and I have to have to talk about the team. We were all there from 5 a.m. in the morning trying to paint the streets. Um, and there were about 50 partner organizations um, a bunch of volunteers, a bunch of students who were really interested in it. And one of the running joke was that any media or any communication we do, half of the page is just filled with the number of partners. And you can see that even here, half my slide was almost filled with the number of partners. 
And these partners were not just there with us on the day off, but they were there throughout the process, engaging with community, allowing people to understand that the streets were more than what they were used to seeing them as. So really becoming our interpreters in, in believing in change and seeing change um, through the communities. And of course, like any good project, we were measuring change, looking at perception of people, how that had changed um, from being from feeling unsafe before to feeling much more safer in the same space. And beyond perception also, we wanted to bring numbers in there and talk about reduction and talk about throughput because that's what mattered for some other people. And I'm gonna go through these quick um, st uh, stories that I, you know, I, I feel that I wouldn't do justice if I don't talk about them. Um, you know, talking about unifying cities to speak the same language, uh, we use the same toolkit in Mumbai, and of course here, the strategy was slightly different. Um, the intervention happened in the outskirts of the city, so we couldn't bring people to this intervention to experience and see the change, so we took the intervention to the people uh, with the help and support of the media. Now, I've lived in India for most of my life. Never ever in my life have I heard any newspaper article or anyone talk about pedestrian rights. But we, this was the first time that there were these week-long articles that kept coming in, that kept talking about this intervention, putting that pressure um, upwards towards the pol to, to buy that political support to ask for that change. So there was a demand that the media could generate through this intervention. Also, you can always tie up with existing events, like what we did in Sao Paulo and Fortaleza. But what's interesting is that standing um, shoulder to shoulder with some of the engineers the night before when you're working on ground, you can really have discussions and you can really talk about changing things. Um, and knowing that the stakes are low, that this is only going to be for one day, you can go bold. And that's what we did in some, uh, in some Sao Paulo. Um, I have some colleagues here who, who were there, and I know uh, we have Eloisa from Sao Paulo here too with us. Uh, she was great to work with. Um, and you know, you can see this change. And what's amazing is now we're working towards improving and um, informing the manual. So we're really changing the state of practice to that one intervention and that one night. I mean, if you spend, if you're at a site with someone till 1 a.m. in the morning, there's a different bond. So um, I don't know how much that counts to it, but that definitely helps. Um, and then Sky mentioned Fortaleza. And one of the stories that is, that is my favorite here in Fortaleza is the fact that this woman here took it upon herself to get over six pages of signatures so that the space that was changed could stay changed. She had seen the change and she wanted, she believed in this change um, and that was, that was her contribution to it. So she was empowered as, as the community to ask for it. Um, and of course the mayor after that announced um, a, a citywide program for such, such interventions. And coming back lastly to wrap this up um, is Addis Ababa that, that Sky mentioned. But the idea that you can start with just one line, one training and take it into the next stage of interim and capital construction. And now the city just recently launched a safe intersection program. So that one day at site and that one line that you drew in a training to going up to or scaling up to something that is as big as a citywide program can happen with these tools. So whether it is the mayor in Fortaleza or the engineers and authorities in Addis, we can all speak the same language. And lastly, we, when we think of change, we always think of these big, heavy capital uh, projects, but the true change always comes from within. And whether you call it the small uh, wins or tactical urbanism, it's these tools and these changes that not only empower us as designers, but also empower the citizens in the community to ask for change, demand for change, and most importantly, believe in change. Thank you. I'm gonna ask, do we have time for a video? It'll be very quick, no, okay, 40 seconds? Okay, great. So here's the Bollywood moves that Sky mentioned.
I didn't see you dancing, Ankita. Thank you. But it always makes me want to dance when we watch that movie. Um, next up, I'd love to, uh, I'm going to introduce to wrap things up today our last speaker, Ronnie Matthew Harris, who's the visionary lead at Go Bronzeville. Uh, now, Ronnie's an experienced speaker and counselor and social entrepreneur with an uncanny knack of bringing people and places and things together. Um, he has, he's an experienced urban mission strategist, and I, you know, I was reading this and I feel like that deserves like a superhero cape or something. As an urban mission strategist, <laughs> Ronnie has devoted his life to seeing people flourish within the context of global cities while advocating for equitable access to quality life. He's the founding member of Sacred Roots, a community learning and development enterprise that seeks to provide progressive alternatives of hope for marginalized communities through creating strategic partnerships. And a lot of the work we're talking here today is about that partnership as we're hearing from many of the speakers. Today, Ronnie's gonna to talk to us about his work interacting with the community and about showing them alternative ways to plan their journeys and their neighborhoods without using the car. And as I welcome Ronnie up, we have to note that Ronnie's from Chicago, so we have to give him an extra big round of applause to say thank you for hosting us in your gorgeous city this week. Thanks, Ronnie. Um, thank you so much for that uh, warm introduction. Um, I'm reminded of uh, the guy that inspired Michael Jordan. Uh, if you ever wanted to know who, in fact, inspired Michael Jordan to be the athlete he was, it is Julius Irving of the Philadelphia 76ers. Um, but when Julius Irving was retiring, uh, at his retirement dinner, he spoke of names no one knew when asked, who was the athlete that challenged you most? And he went to naming Sam Devois and Booby and Poo Poo and Kenye and Kanye and all kinds of names that nobody in the sports world knew. And I feel a bit like that today standing here because the truth is so many people in my community could be standing here the truth is so many people here in chicago could be standing here i stand on the shoulders of so many men and women that have done so much to advocate for change in the city of chicago and cities throughout the world and so many of you that worked for agencies here in the city and are now somewhere else in the world so many of you that sat behind desks or laptops and do what you do at cafes or wherever you work, you could be standing here on the behalf of some of your colleagues that so done so much to see Chicago become the city it is becoming. And so I am well aware that I stand on the shoulders of so many people like you, and I want to note that even at the onset. I'm the son of former slaves a people group who migrated here from the Deep South. In fact, I love to pe tell people that I'm as far south as you can go in the U.S. before the Gulf, Gulfport, Mississippi. But having migrated here to the north to find promise, my people, as many of you know, were redlined. And redlined here in Chicago, my family lived in a community just south of the Central Business District, Bronzeville. Bronzeville is a black enclave, a black enclave that would ultimately give the world its first ethnic black, although I would argue biracial, president. And I think it's really clever that um, President Barack Obama, when coming back to Chicago after his years at college and uh, law professor, et cetera, et cetera, would, would buy a house that if you come out his front door, it's arguable that he was in Kenwood. If you come out his side door and cross the street, it's argued that he's in High Park. If you come out his back door, we claim him in Bronzeville. <laughs> but I will say that he voted for himself two times in two different elections, uh, right uh, around the corner from my house in Bronzeville. And so we love to say that Bronzeville uh, is the place that Barack Obama and Michelle Obama uh, can call home. Uh, it is on that uh, political 
might in Bronzeville that I think he rose to become president. But still, today, those people in Bronzeville are experiencing a renaissance. When it comes to transportation infrastructure, we here in Chicago have spent a secret source of the city of Chicago told me upwards about a billion dollars improving on infrastructure in Bronzeville. Uh, I take pride in that because I do provide uh, leadership to a community initiative called Bronze Go Bronzeville, a community initiative that initially started in the city uh, Chicago Department of Transportation. Uh, this was designed to get people in my community and other communities here in the city to get out and walk, bike, and use public transportation. And they were to come into Bronzeville and then go on to other consecutive communities. What they did not anticipate, I don't think, and some of them are in the room, is me, a son of the Mississippi soil, having moved to the city, pursuing a promise. And so when the city came to me and said, hey, we'd love for you to be uh, one of our outreach ambassadors, to get people in your community to walk, bike, and use public trans, to the surprise for most of my friends and family and colleagues, Ronnie, why on earth would you sell out to the enemy? And to this day, still, sometimes, I'm considered that sellout, that soul out to the city. But I am convinced that there are corresponding data sets that motivate me every day. Because see, my community is a community like so many of your communities where people of color have disproportionate numbers of like health disparities, right? Um, diabetes, hypertension, and then crime. How many of you have seen in the news the extent to which Chicago struggle with crime and violence. And then when it comes to like economic viability, to drive through some of the corridors in my community, it's still the case that we can't find a viable option for a good coffee. But I'm convinced that this program will ultimately be a tool that can transform worldview perspectives where people in my community begin to ask themselves some critical questions. And one of the ones I love to ask them is, let me ask you a question for a moment. If you went into your mother, your grandmother's house, and you went into the basement, would you find a bike? Do you remember when we rode bikes? Do you remember what happened to the fact that we rode bikes? Yeah people start snatching our bikes, right? And so we gave up our bikes. But what would happen if we activated our streets and we got back on bikes? Would we be healthier? Would we be more economically viable as a community? And oftentimes, it's right there that you see people sort of like look and wonder, yeah, I do remember when we rode bikes. But as I was thinking about speaking to you today, the choir, what would I ultimately say? I didn't really want to say so much about what we do day to day. I do invite you to historic Bronzeville, Black Enclave, just walking distance from the Central Business District. But what I really wanted to say to you, and I want to leave with you, is a story. It is this story. The story of a man that was stranded having ran out of gas but in the distance, he found the twinkling light and walked towards it, not knowing that he would find a cliff and fell off it. And as he fell, he reached out in hopes that he would grab anything that would save his life. And he just hoped and hoped until he grabbed hold to a branch and held on. And he held on. And right here, I want you to contemplate that guy or gal, that family, that person in your community that you're working for, he just held on. And then in desperation, he cried out, God, help me. And there was this still, small voice that said, let go. And he held on and held on in desperation for his life. 
and then cried out again, God, help me, lest I die. And that still small voice said, let go. Believing he was losing his mind, he held on all the more, eventually losing all of his strength where he couldn't hang on anymore. He let go, only to discover that he was about six inches from the ground. But in utter, utter darkness, he could not see it. So many people of color, black, Latino, and other, around the world in low to moderate income communities are like that gentleman, NIMBYs, holding on to all they knew. And so I say that to encourage you that when you have a pathology that so many of us have in our communities, when you're sitting behind your computer and when you're working behind your desk, diligently doing what you're doing to provide us with more flourishing communities, what I came here to say to each and every one of you, I hope that you're mindful that transportation, what you do, can be a conduit for freedom, justice, and a flourishing community for people that have been bound for so long. But it's going to take you having empathy in the fact that they had been bound in darkness, marginalized for so long. I really have been overwhelmingly touched to be among you this week. And so, um, um, I want to leave you with this parting thought. That what you do, I think, is transform lives every day. And I'm grateful for your work. Thank you so much, Ronnie. It's very inspiring lessons, I think, for all of us today and a really wonderful way to wrap up um, a series of great speakers. And today you've heard different stories and strategies and tools um, that I hope you guys can take away to help other people to see and believe what's possible, whether it's through projects or processes and, as we've heard today, most importantly, working with people. Uh, we hope that you can take the lessons and go forth and continue to fight for changes in your cities. So thanks very much. And I'm going to invite Corinne Kistner up here on stage. And one final round of applause for our speakers today. Thank you. Thank you.